Make sure you learn what a hematocrit is, if you don't know already. It was on slide number two on this PowerPoint. I skipped it. I want you to read about a hematocrit on your own. Hematocrit. Cool. And look, I have some slides on here for the anemias, even though it's in the homeostatic imbalances. So you can use the slides to study as well as looking at your book for that. I will talk about this. This is sickle cell. Sickle cell anemia makes a red blood cell get this shape. Well, that doesn't look good to me. Does it to you? It's a great slide. It's malformed hemoglobin, okay, that causes this. It's actually the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell that causes it to develop this shape. Okay, tell me what's hemoglobin? Okay, it's a, it's a polypeptide group, right, four polypeptide chains. It's a protein. In the protein, hemoglobin, this is crazy. A protein is just a chain of amino acids, right? Okay, it's 146. You don't have to know that. It's 146 amino acids long. The only difference between normal hemoglobin and sickle cell hemoglobin is one amino acid in the whole chain. It's the sixth amino acid. You don't need to know that either. But that's it. One amino acid is different. It's changed. It's mutated. The code, the DNA, you might remember transcription and translation and uh, DNA replication and all that crazy stuff. Well, I know that it comes from areas where malaria is high and the sickle cell gene actually protects you from malaria, which people that have sickle cell will get malaria and they'll fight it and they won't die from it. So their lifespan is lengthened, but it's shorter than the average person because it's down to 30. But why that? It's genetic. That's why. And probably because those peoples come from that area where malaria was. But do I understand it all? No, not all of it. Is that not crazy, guys? One amino acid on the chain is different. And it changes your life completely. And that's only one protein in the whole body. One amino acid on one protein, well, that's in one-third of all your cells, so it's pretty darn important. And the average lifespan of somebody with sickle cell is about 30. Not right now. They can't, they can't cure it. They're going to be getting better at stuff like that, at all the genetic stuff in the future. And going to get scary actually it's going to be cool and it's going to be interesting and you're going to be able to order up your baby with all the traits that you want and one of those traits could be i don't want my baby to have the sickle cell gene so it won't die at 30 then the other one will be i want my baby to have blue eyes so you know boy i want my baby to be six two not five two uh, you're going to have all these choices Wait till I'm 100 and come talk to me. Because I'll still be alive because I'm going to have choices and I'm going to grow a new heart. White blood cells, technically called leukocytes. Leuco means white. Look at that. Look how much of the total blood volume they make up. Is that not hilarious? You can't live without them. But they make up that little bitty amount of your total blood volume. We already know that. The count, what's an average count? Five to nine thousand. You could say four to eleven. It depends on where exactly you grab it. But notice, the count's in the thousands, right? It's in the thousands. 
and the red cell counts in the millions. Wow, that's crazy. See, this is so cool. The white blood cells leave, they actually leave and squeeze through a capillary. That process is called diapodesis, when they squeeze out of the capillary. Then they get out there into the tissues. And there's a capillary. Here's what happens. When the white blood cells are rolling through a blood vessel, what they do is they will attach, and it would be, bit, but anyway, it would attach to the edge here, and it would slow down. And it would slow down, and then it would go and squeeze through, and it would be out here in the tissues. So that process of squeezing through, what do we call it? Diapodesis. Once it's out here, it moves like an amoeba. You know what an amoeba is? It's a unicellular organism, kind of like a blob. So there you can see, we say that its motion is called amoeboid motion. Amoeboid motion. That means, and this is so neat, guys, it changes its shape as it crawls. It'll reach a little arm out, and that'll pull the rest of the cell. And then it'll reach an arm out on the other side, and it'll just be crawling along, reaching these little arms out. That's what your white blood cells do. And where do they go? See, if here's the infection, look at this. What a white blood cell will do is it's smart. It's like a bloodhound. It'll get a little scent, a little chemical scent, and it will move around until it finds more and more and more and more, and it will zero in on the infectious material that way. They call that chemotaxis. Specifically, they call it positive chemotaxis. But chemotaxis, what's that mean? It's like a chemical taxi. It's picking up a chemical scent, and it's following it. Because white blood cells, they take particles in to themselves through the membrane. They're just fascinating cells. You know, your white blood cells, they go places on purpose. Wrap your brain around that. Your little white blood cells, of which you are not aware of which there are about 8,000 in every cubic millimeter of your blood, are going out into your tissues all the time and crawling around and looking for foreign material to either eat or destroy in some way. That is so, so cool. If your white cell count goes over 11,000, we would call that a leukocytosis. That is an increased white blood cell count. Common when you have an infection. That's why they take your blood when you go to the doctor. And they might do a differential cell count and see if it's eosinophils that are high. Because if those are high, you might be infected with a parasite. Or if your neutrophils are highest, if they're like above 70%, your neutrophils are 75%, you might have a bacterial infection. Oh, wow. You mean that's how it works? What if your monocytes are high? Monocytes become macrophages. They respond to tissue damage, so you have some kind of tissue damage going on. Or what if your lymphocytes are high? Well, you've got some kind of specific immunity going on. So there's all kinds of really cool things that they can determine through blood tests. So, you know, it's not really a waste of time for your doctor to take blood. In fact, they probably don't take blood enough, to be honest. And they just say, oh, it looks like this, so we'll do this. Here's the breakdown. We kind of know this stuff already. So I'm not going to spend time on it. I'm not going to talk about them again. I will say this, what we haven't said. Your actual white blood cells are divided into two categories, granulocytes, which have granules, and you know for sure eosinophils and basophils have those, but so do neutrophils. Even though they're pale, they had little granules. I don't know if you were aware or not, but they did. Now, these cells usually don't live that long. 
compared to red blood cells. But check this out. Your, oh, and I'm going to skip all of those because we've done all of that. There's their pictures. Those aren't good. A granulocytes. Lymphocytes and monocytes have no visible granules. Kidney, spherical, or even a horseshoe-shaped nucleus on some monocytes. But here's the cool thing. They live longer, usually, than red blood cells. Macrophages live for months, some of them years. Lymphocytes can live for decades. That's crazy. But how long do nerve cells live? Your whole life. So, you know, not so bad. Hopefully, Matthew. All right. Well, you know, you mentioned that thing about alcohol earlier. It kills kills cells. Alcohol, you know, that bad chemical. Hey, here's, here's one thing. Oh, we'll let that go. Okay, so basophils, which I haven't mentioned, basophils contain a chemical called histamine. Do you guys know about histamine? What do you know about histamine? Ah, inflammation. Histamine goes with allergies. Basophils cause your allergic symptoms. They cause it. It's a signal gone haywire late in the semester, or when we do the immune system, we'll talk about how. We'll talk about how antibodies play a role in that as well. And it's pretty fascinating, realistically. Anyway, histamine causes an increase in capillary permeability. You guys know what that means? Look, I'll use the same capillary here. It means it allows fluid to leave. And when fluid leaves, it swells up that area. Also, the blood vessels in that area, they dilate. By the way, Texans, it's not dilate. They dilate. No, they just dilate. Okay. That's what histamine does. That's why when you have an allergic reaction, you get all the fluid build up, you get the clogged stuff. It's not just histamines. It can be leukotrienes and prostaglandins and all kinds of stuff. But we're learning a little about histamines right now. There are another group of cells that are out in the tissues called mast cells, and they're basically like basophils that are in the tissues. They're different because basophils can be in the tissues too, but they're very similar. They do the histamine thing. They do inflammation. And usually when we talk about basophils, we'll talk about mast cells, and I'll say that exact same thing every time. So also associate histamine with mast cells. That's a great monocyte. Remember, know your counts on the white blood cell. Okay. Here's your white blood cell picture. Make it bigger for you. All blood cells are coming from what kind of cell? Hemocytoblast, which is a blood stem cell. Look at the path, though. There's two primary pathways and then multiple tiny pathways that determine which kind of white blood cell it will be. I do not care that you memorize these names. You know the first one and you know all the last ones. Except for when we show the platelet later. I'll give you the, say, the name of the cell that platelets come off of. Leukopenia is a low white blood cell count. Hey, commonly medications can do that. Chemo does that. Leukemia is cancer of the bone marrow because it produces way, way too many white blood cells. I mean, we can be talking like 75,000 on a white cell count instead of 7,000. 
That's ten times as much. I would like for you guys, in addition to reading about anemia, to read about leukemia. And then we get to the little old guys, the little platelets. They are fragments of this cell right here. Hemocytoblast becomes eventually a megakaryocyte. You do need that name. Look, it's big. That's why it's called mega. Karyo means? It means nucleus. It's a big nucleated cell. Oh, what a shock. It's not like a red cell. It didn't give up its nucleus. It didn't shrink down. But look here. This is what it's showing you. Remember how I said like the stamps? As fluid flows by, it just kind of peels little pieces off. They're little chemical sacs called platelets. Now, the books all say, and this blows me away, they say a platelet is one quarter of the size of a red blood cell. We saw blood. Did any platelet look anywhere near a quarter of the size of a red blood cell? I personally don't believe them. Maybe when a platelet's out in the tissues and it swells up and becomes sticky, but I don't, you know, they're small. You see blood slides all the time. They're tiny. They look like a tenth or a twentieth in my eye, of a red blood cell, okay? Well, now we get to the fun part. This is what I'm going to give you for your listening pleasure. Hemostasis. Hemostasis means the slowing down of blood flow. That is not the same, guys, as clotting. Clotting is only one of the three processes that stops blood flow. It's the big one. It's the one that really puts a stop to it, but it is one of the three. See, first what happens when you get injured is your blood vessels actually contract. They spasm, they constrict, and that decreases the blood flowing through them. That's to help protect you. Anybody see Black Hawk Down? I know it was a long time ago. You remember that when the guy was cut real bad by the leg and they were trying to get his artery and they said, it's running away from me. It's running away from me. That's what they do. The muscle in the, lar the vessels would constrict and the blood vessel would pull up in the body because it's not just constricting in diameter. It constricts in length as well to try to stop the blood flow. But, of course, if it's a big artery, you can't stop. It won't. It's not enough to do that. Then you get platelets clogging up the area and aggregating together. There's all kinds of chemical messengers that when you listen to this, you'll pick up. You need to know the names of things like thromboxane and serotonin. So when you hear that on the talk, make sure that you pay attention to that. Okay? So platelets clog up. Tiny blood vessels, platelets can clog them up and actually stop some bleeding. However, in the larger ones, we actually need a clot to form. And platelets and red blood cells and white blood cells will all get trapped in that clot. And as we know, that clot's made of what? Fiber. Fibrin. And there is a whole pathway. This is, there's a lot to this. And I'm putting a lot on you by making you learn this. But I kind of want you to. And you're going to see a picture like this. I will tell you in my talk, I tell you what you need versus don't need. Okay? I'm very particular. You don't need the names of all these numbers. There's very specific stuff you need, like intrinsic and extrinsic pathway and prothrombin activator and the fact that calcium and vitamin K are clotting factors, very important clotting factors. And this slide will be very crucial to your understanding, and you'll hear me talk about it. And it may not be this actual slide that I have up there, on the, the one that you're going to listen, but I will definitely go through this with you in that integrity. That's a clot. That's fibrin trapping red blood cells. Wow. And some platelets. You see them all over the place. This is a little big one and some littler ones. 
looks like a spider web, doesn't it? Kind of a real thick spider web. And what's really cool is in the platelets, well, there's like actin and myosin, and they start to actually contract and squeeze and pull the fibers, and it squeezes fluid out of it and makes it stronger and tighter, which is really, really cool stuff. Yeah, see, clot retraction. All this will be on there. Okay, so what stops a clot from growing? First off, when you have a blood clot develop or when you clot to stop that, you don't need to, it to stay there forever because the tissue is going to heal itself. So notice this. There's a process called fibrinolysis. We know words. What's fibrinolysis mean? Break down a fibrin. It begins within a couple of days. Who would have guessed that there's an inactive blood protein, right? That's what ogen means, that becomes activated through a certain mechanism that you don't really need to know the whole mechanism. But plasminogen is converted into plasmin, and it starts to bust up the fibrin and break up the clot. Why does it not happen instantly? Your tissue's not repaired, you would start bleeding again. So it gives you a couple of days head start on the repair so you can get some connective tissue in there, fill the stuff up, and then slowly start to digest the clot at the same time. It's fascinating the way that it works. Two things right here that prevent clots from becoming too large. Well, we have blood still coursing through that area. So the fluid that comes in there removes clotting factors and it dilutes them. That's cool. And then certain clotting factors are inhibited. And I really don't get all heavy into the names of clotting factors on there. So you don't have to worry. Blood clotting can be hugely complex and complicated in the way that I talk about it is I usually stick with the basics. All right, there's this very important chemical that you'll hear about later on. It's called thrombin. Thrombin is what activates the fibrinogen. So thrombin is an enzyme that activates fibrinogen and causes it to produce fibrin. Therefore, some of the things that inhibit clot formation are called antithrombin. They would block thrombin. See, thrombin leads to fibrin. So if you don't want fibrin, you block thrombin. I bet three quarters of you, oh, at least half of you have heard of this. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Oh, well, one third. Okay, good enough. Oh, maybe more. Okay. Heparin. Heparin used in a hospital? Heparin is an anti-thrombin. It works against thrombin. It inactivates thrombin. So what happens if you inactivate thrombin? You do not produce what? The clot, the fibers, the fibrin. Oh, and I don't know why they why that's there twice, so my bad. Not big on that slide. There's the one. Okay. In a blood vessel, a clot is technically known as a thrombus. That is a clot that forms within a vessel. It is attached to the vessel wall. Can clots break free? And when they break free and they are free floating, they are called an embolus. And 
as the blood vessels get smaller and smaller, a free-floating embolus would eventually get stuck in a small blood vessel, and then it would be called an embolism. So you don't... Uh-oh, I hopped. Yeah, so it's not spelled there, so I'll spell it for you. I will say this. A, so you can see how I would spell this, cerebral embolism, there's embolism, can cause strokes. An embolism is what? That's, that's an embolus. An embolism is one that has been lodged. Okay, so it was a thrombus, it broke free, it's an embolus, it lodges in something, and it's called an embolism. See, if we had a big blood vessel here, and there was a clot like this size in it, see, it could travel through these. And then as these branched off and got smaller, if it went this way, it could eventually get stuck right there. And then everything from this point down would do what? It would actually die if there wasn't collateral circulation, which there commonly is. But that's one cause of strokes. It's one cause of heart attacks. It's causes of lots of different things that go on. You cut off the blood flow, then you cut off the oxygen to all these tissues in that little localized area, and that area dies off. If it's a big blood vessel and a big clot, you got big problems. If it's a little bitty, teeny, teeny, tiny one, maybe not so many problems. Yes, sir? Oh, you're just stretching? Okay. Now, this is cool. Aspirin, how does it work? Aspirin inhibits prostaglandin formation. And one of the chemicals that you will learn about, which is produced by platelets, is called thromboxane. And it is a prostaglandin. Aspirin inhibits formation of that. That causes vasoconstriction, so you won't get that vasoconstriction going on. So it helps keep the blood vessels big. It also stimulates platelets to clump together and form the plug. So it blocks the platelet plug formation. Heparin we talked about. Produced by basophils and mast cells as well, just like histamine. And have you ever heard of warfarin or coumadin? What's the other name? Yeah, they call it a blood thinner, right? Vitamin K. What do you know about vitamin K? It is considered a clotting factor. Do you know where vitamin K comes from? <laughs> bah ha ha ha. The bacteria in your colon make it for you. Without bacteria, we do not produce this clotting factor. We need them. One reason that antibiotics aren't always so good for you is they wipe out your normal flora, which makes a clotting factor right here, vitamin K. Coumadin or warfarin inhibits that clotting factor. So it helps to keep the blood thin. When they say a blood thinner, they mean blood that won't clot. Why is vitamin K important? It causes the liver, it stimulates the liver to make the clotting factors. So not only does the liver make plasma protein, your liver makes clotting factors. And the bacteria in your gut produce vitamin K that tells the liver to do that.
Disseminated intravascular coagulation. What does that mean? Disseminated all over. Intravascular within the blood vessel. Clotting, coagulation. These are blood clots all over the place inside your blood vessels. Wow. So what happens is then afterwards, your body's like blown up with clots and then it loses the ability to make more clots and then the people bleed. Bad news. Okay, just like I had you read about um, leukemias and anemias, I want you to just read about a thrombocytopenia. That means, what would it mean? Can you tell me? Right, penia means low, thrombocyte means platelets. Did you? When you had the spleen problem? A normal platelet count, which is not on this PowerPoint, I believe, or maybe it was. I think it was back there. Do you remember what a normal plate count is? See, this is crazy. Your book can't even, if you look on your, in your lab book, on one page it says one thing and on another page it's different. On one page it's like 150 to 400 and on the next page it's 250 to 500,000. The whole point, in my mind, white cells, thousands, usually less than 10. Red cells, millions, around five. Platelets, hundred thousands. Thousands, hundred thousands, millions. There's huge differences there, right? Platelet count around 250,000 would be considered quite normal, about a quarter million. How many functions of the liver have we already hinted at? Plasma proteins, clotting factors, bile, and gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Glycogen storage, right, and breakdown and formation of new sugar from amino acids and fatty acids. We've already done five functions of the liver, and we haven't even got close to the digestive tract yet, or the digestive system. The liver has over 500 functions. It is crazy important to our life. All right, on the talk with blood clotting, I'll go ahead and have you learn blood types as well. So I have that all recorded on there. It's A, B, A, B, and O. I'll explain it all for you. I'll show you how to figure out who can donate blood to whom. And we'll also talk about something called RH factor on that. So when you come to class, 